All right, everyone, my name is Carrie Swore. I'm Chief Growth Officer for Urban Teachers. So I wanna welcome you to our first ever webinar that we've done for a particular city. Um, so tonight is a webinar about um, teaching and living in Washington, DC. So we're excited uh, for you to be here tonight and Amara is gonna be the hostess um, this evening. Um, so Amara is our resident experience coordinator in DC and I'll let you introduce um, the, uh, everybody else. And I'm gonna, um, hide my face if I can, and um, I'll, I can move your slides along. Okay, Amara? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Carrie. Um, hi, everyone. As Carrie said, my name is Amara Pinnock, and I'm the Resident Experience Coordinator for Urban Teachers DC. Um, I'm also an alum. I did the program in 2012 and graduated from it in 2016. I'm going to introduce to you the other staff members we have here this evening. Um, first off, we have our Executive Director, Jacqueline Greer. Jacqueline, you want to say hello? Yep, absolutely. And I think we talk a little bit more about me on the next slide, uh, but I'm really excited that everybody can be here tonight. Thank you, Jacqueline. And then we also have our operations coordinator, Darlene Underwood. Darlene, would you like to say hello? Hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you all this evening. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm going to um, just introduce the topics that we're going to be talking about this evening and then Jacqueline, um, our executive director, is going to be talking with you further. Um, so we're going to go over our program overview just to kind of give you an overview of what the program looks like, our tenants, and how we function. Secondly, we're going to be talking about the impact of urban teachers in DC, so kind of what our work looks like on the ground in our community. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the residency or what that looks like, some of your coursework, some of the coaching and things like that, and to kind of know what we do to train you to be an effective teacher. Then we're gonna go over an example of coursework and coaching so you can get an idea of what that can look like for you. And then finally, we're gonna go over some of the details of what it's like of living in DC. And so here we have our executive director. Um, Jacqueline, do you want to do a brief introduction? Yeah, and this is a, I don't look like this every day. So um, this is just a little bit about my background. I have worked in urban education in DC for the past 14 years. Um, in the past 14 years, we've had a lot of change, not only with our DC public schools, but with DC public charter schools. Um, we're one of the fastest improving public school districts in the country. Um, and I'm just really excited for all of you who are coming to DC to see the great work that you would be doing with us. Um, when you join us on June 19th. So just a little bit about me. A lot of my work has been in talent, um, but I believe Urban Teachers is the strongest teacher training program in the District of Columbia, and I'm very committed to the students of the District of Columbia, so it's extremely important um, that we are bringing high quality teachers into the district. Um, and in here you'll see a very funny tidbit that I have a rescue dog named Harper, so if you hear barking in the background, that is Harper just saying hello. So Urban Teachers has welcomed over 680 residents nationwide. Last year, we welcomed 73 residents into the District of Columbia, and this year, we'd like to welcome between 100 and 120. Overall, our demographics are 58% people of color for our cohorts. 38% of our folks are in the Mid-Atlantic region, and our average GPA for participants is a 3.3. It dips a little bit for our math participants. 38% of our Urban Teachers colleagues are first-generation college students, um, which we think is very, is a great statistic. Um, and we think that that experience is unique. I myself am a first-generation college student, um, and I think it's really, really important in working with the students that we work with to understand their experiences and some of the, the hiccups they may encounter um, at going to college to be the first in their family or to be the first generation, really getting that great accolade of a college degree. And then 37% of our folks enter right out of undergrad, so the other, 63% um, have done a city year or breakthrough or jumpstart or some sort of education related experience that they feel gives them some insight into the work. So this is a quick overview of the model. Hopefully if you're in the program, you've heard this a few times, but I'm happy to refresh your memory. So this is the one, two, three, four of Urban Teachers. We're a one year residency program. And in Urban Teachers years, it's actually a 14 month residency program. You have a summer A with us, a full year of residency, and then a summer B. So you'll serve as a co-teacher in three to four different settings in Urban Teachers with a lot of support from us, working a full day and going to coursework in the evening. It is a grind, it is hard, and it is the best preparation for what your first year of teaching would look like if you weren't in a program like Urban Teachers. So just, to, just so you know what the first year holds. Urban Teachers, since we're a master's degree program with Johns Hopkins University, you'll have two years to earn your master's degree. Um, and that is a one master's degree, from Johns Hopkins 
You'll be able to walk at Johns Hopkins. You'll earn all of that through our program. We have set programs of study for your coursework as well. But we really believe that our coursework, given that it's clinical, will equip you to be a really solid teacher. So you're not going to take a course in the history of education. We're not going to ask you for your education philosophy, but you are going to learn very practical skills like guided reading, working with special education students, understanding the laws around inclusion. You're really going to get a really hands-on degree that equips you to be an effective teacher in our schools. The three in our one, two, three, four of urban teachers is one-on-one -on -one coaching. So every urban teacher's participant receives at least 100 hours of coaching to ensure that you're continually improving your performance. Um, our teacher practice rubric is aligned with DC Public Schools Impact Rubric and with the rubrics of a variety of charter schools. It's not directly aligned with all of those, but it is a rubric that we feel will best equip you to work in urban schools. And the demands of that rubric increase every single year. But you're going to have an urban teacher's coach to, coach to work with you every side of every step of the way. Um, so it's really, really critical that you take that coaching very seriously. And that coaching, once you're finished with your coaching and your coursework, that's how we determine whether or not you're ready for certification. And then the four in the one year residency, the two years of master's clinical coursework, the three years of one-on-one -on -one coaching, the four is the commitment that we ask you to make to working in our schools. Turnover in DC public and charter, public charter schools is close to 40% each year. And the only way we're gonna stabilize outcomes for our kids is to stay in the schools where we place. So we ask you to make a four-year commitment, a residency plus three more years. And many of our participants actually come back for a fourth or fifth year in our program. We're only seven years old, um, so we're not sure how many more go on to leadership after that, but we are diligently working on that. All right, this is our second slide that really talks about um, all of our components. So right now you're in the recruitment phase, you've chosen urban teachers, you've passed through our gates, you're getting ready to go into your residency starting in June. Um, and so it's really great time for you to know that 30% of our folks are actually accepted on average to urban teachers. So you're amongst a selective group. Not everybody gets in, we put you through a very rigorous day and that's just the icing on the cake for what's gonna be a really rigorous experience. Of that, you know, 70, 80% of our folks actually pass through the residency program. So some folks will try residency and realize that this isn't what they wanted to do um, or that they really don't want to teach. And so we, we understand that, but the grand majority of you who are coming to be an effective teacher in urban education are going to get the skills and preparation you need to do well. In your second year, which is actually your first teaching year, um, that is when you continue in our program. If you've continued your 3.0 GPA in your coursework, maintain grades of B minus or higher, and then met our increasing performance expectations. Year three of teaching, again, with our accountability, we're raising the bar even higher. So where at the end of residency, you have to get an average of 2.0 on your teacher practice rubric. At the end of year two, it's a 2.5. At the end of year three, it's a 3.0. So the bar does continue to go up, but we're still there to coach you side by side and make sure that you can meet it. At the end of year three is when you become eligible for your regular two license. And that is what would enable you to teach and get what we call tenure and to continue your teaching career in one of our districts. What is the teaching rubric? Great question, Sarah. Um, we're gonna come to questions in a moment, but the TPR is the teacher practice rubric. I don't know if there's a sample that's been included in our materials, but that has a lot of the look for's that we're looking for when we look at your classroom. So we're gonna walk in and wonder and look around and gather your data and see if, you're, um, if you have a classroom management system in place. If you're using a kid watching tool to monitor which students are on task and which students are not. If you're gonna direct a lesson, so if you're teaching in a way that's saying, hey, I'm the teacher, stop and listen to me. Or if you're using accountable talk strategies where teachers, where students are dialoguing back and forth with you because nobody wants to just sit and listen for hours and hours. Um, so what we use with our teacher practice rubric is really ensuring that you're taking the clinical components we're teaching you in coursework and the feedback you're getting from your coach and putting that in place in your practice. Does that answer your question? And we'll come to that. I think if not in this presentation, we can follow up. Okay, great. Um, year four is your teaching year. Again, as I've said, 76% of our participants who finished our year one residency come back in their districts to teach, but 91% of our four-year program completers return to fourth year teachers. So even if people leave us, they often stay in the teaching profession. It might not be one in one of our partner districts. We want everyone to finish their four-year commitment in their partner districts, in their partner schools. This is the only way that we feel like we have the scale and ability to change outcomes for kids in DC. All right. 
I'll go on to the next slide. So our impact in DC, we're gonna speak a little bit about some of the data that we've seen in the district. So this is a map of five different categories of schools in DC. The orange circle are priority schools, which are the highest need schools. And the purple circle are the highest need, are the highest performing schools. So this is Washington District of Columbia. If you'll notice it's 10 miles by 10 miles. I would love for folks to chat any trends that they see looking at this map. Stay with, if you could stay with the map, I want people to look at that and chat any trends that they see. Any noticings? This is what we call a check for understanding and wait time to make sure that people are listening. All right, Caitlin chatted, the priority schools are centering around the southeast part of the district. Thank you so much. Sarah just said the purple's mostly on the left. David said more of the priority focus schools are across the river. Thank you all so much. It sounds like you're already very familiar with Washington. And so that's really exciting. All good answers. And we can give you some extra credit coming into Summer Institute. Um, so yes, that is definitely the trend in the district. Our schools that are circles are DC public schools, charter schools are triangles. And what you'll notice is that a lot of our schools that are still in need of improvement are in Southeast DC. The majority of the children of, child go of school going age are in wards seven and eight, which are in the bottom right. And those are our highest poverty wards in the District of Columbia. So that's where we spend the majority of our time. And that's where we place the majority of our participants because those are the wards that often get overlooked. So I really wanted to point that out. If you look in the middle of the map, you've got the mall and the Capitol and all those very fancy places. We are going to see that a few times in your work and then you're gonna be mostly in Southeast and in a whole variety of communities that really need awesome teachers. You'll also see um, a lot of green throughout the map in Southeast, some blue, not a lot of purple, not what you see in Upper Northwest. So I just want you to orient yourself with the kind of work and with the kind of locations that we're working in. DC has a lot of incredibly culturally rich neighborhoods, and those are the ones that we're going to primarily focus in. So right now, DC has the second highest share of public charter schools um, in the country outside of New Orleans, and New Orleans was a takeover district, um, but 46% of our kids go to public charter schools, and the rest, the other 54%, go to DC public schools, which makes it a very unique way of working in DC. Um, I find that we, we really enjoy working in both public charter and DC public schools. There's not a ton of difference in those two systems, I don't think. That's my opinion. And our philosophy at Urban Teachers is that we go where the students are. So some of you may be in charters, some of you may be in DCPS. We really don't differentiate. We want placements where there's a good group of teachers who want to host residents and some really focused principals who are looking for better outcomes for their schools. So those are the criteria that we look for when selecting schools, but DC is a unique district where they are working in both public charter and DC public schools. And I'm sure if you're, you studied education, you know about Kaya Henderson and Michelle Ree and mayoral takeover and a lot of the excitement that's been happening in the district over the last 10 years. It'll be 10 years on June 12th since Michelle Ree was appointed chancellor. Um, and it's really hard to believe it's gone that fast. So if you look, it's about neck and neck in terms of public and public charter schools. Um, the only difference is that public charter schools are operated by independent bodies, some for-profit, mostly nonprofit, and DCPS is one LEA, which is a local education agency. All right, on to the next one. Any questions so far about impact in DC? All right, just chat me a yes or no if you have anything, any other questions. No questions from Caitlin. Caitlin, across the finish line with no questions. All right, so this is a different way. I'm a visual learner, so it's really important for me to read things and see things. If someone tells me something, I may remember it, but if you write me something, I will definitely remember it. Um, and I know that about myself. So I also like pictures and illustrations and drawings. Um, some of my team members will ask a question and get a drawing back and be like, what is that? But that's my way of explaining my thinking. And so this particular graphic really does explain all of the supports that you're going to get in our residency year. 
beginning with Summer Institute. So Summer Institute is your welcome to urban teachers. You're going to see us a lot. You're going to have summer mentors. You're going to have PLCs. It's going to be the best six weeks of your life, and it's going to be incredibly exhausting, but fun. Um, so Summer Institute, in the morning, you're working in, a, in an out-of-school time program like Higher Achievement or working with one of our charter or DC public school partners and working in summer school, which is a great time. And then in the afternoon, beginning at 1 p.m., you're going to be in coursework until 6 p.m. each evening. In addition to that, we have field day, we have orientation, we have placement fairs. There's going to be a lot going on for Summer Institute. So whatever extra energy you have now, you're going to want to save that to come to Summer Institute. Your room and board is covered for Summer Institute. And it's going to be held at Catholic University. Um, we'll get the start and end dates out to you. Darlene and Amara will really work to ensure that you get the information that you need to be able to enroll and move in in a timely fashion. So in addition, once Summer Institute is over, you're gonna move into your host school. So if you look at the graphic on the right, you'll see that there's immersion with your host teacher during, some, during the school year. So you go from our Summer Institute, where you may have a summer be as your host resident, to a school setting where you're going to be working with a host teacher. When I've asked residents what their relationship with their host teacher is like, they say it's somewhat like a marriage, um, but this is the person that you're gonna work with every day, eight to 10 hours a day, you're really gonna have to be partners and co-teachers in the classroom. Um, and so we work to select host teachers that are really open to having residents. Um, we've already told them that you're gonna have a bunch of questions. We highly encourage you to meet with them an hour a week to co-plan. You're really gonna wanna go above and beyond in the classroom setting. And at the end of the year, your host teacher is likely gonna have some input as to whether or not you're hired into the classroom um, or into the school site. So it's a critical partnership for the residency year. In most schools, we try to also switch host teachers midway through the year. So you'll have a fall host teacher and then a spring host teacher. So you get to see two different types of classrooms. That model is not perfect. Some places we switch, some places we do not. In addition, in your residency, you're still gonna get a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching from your clinical faculty member um, who will be working with you and a lot of them will instruct you on in coursework. And in addition, they will also coach you. And then, of course, you're going to get about 80% of the work done leading to your master's degree, which is focusing primarily on your subject area, which we'll come to in a moment, but also has coursework on special education. It's our philosophy that you, even if you aren't teaching a specific special education class, are going to be working with students who learn differently or who are differently abled, um, who may have identified or unidentified special needs. A uh, participant told me a few years ago that she decided that instead of her thinking her students were going to le learn the way that she taught, she needed to teach in the way that her students learned. Um, and I think that that dual focus really helped her to be able to do that. And then in addition to that, you're going to get extensive classroom experience in your school site five days a week um, throughout the entirety of the residency year. And this is just a quote from David Bain, who's cohort 2012. He's a Mars cohort. So when he's in his fifth year in the classroom at Excel Academy Public Charter Schools, which is an all-girls all school. So if you see, he's, I think, a third or fourth grade teacher there, and he's been there since his residency. He's an amazing colleague. And he's a leader on our fellow advisory board as well. So he gives us feedback now because of his standing in the program. Questions on the residency year? All right, I don't see any questions, so we'll keep going. Coursework and coaching. So we're gonna just walk through a brief sample of how many courses you're going to take during the fall semester. If you notice, you, I said you're gonna be in coursework four nights a week, and this is many more than four courses, um, but it's important for you to know that we stack some of these courses, so some will be the first six weeks, some will be the second six weeks. Case in point, Emergent and Early Reading is a course you'll have on, say, a Tuesday night, beginning in September and going through mid-October. And then in mid-October, you would have reading in the upper grades in that same time slot through the end of the semester. So you're going to get a lot more courses than it appears that you would get to be able to take in four nights a week. Um, you know, same thing with introduction to assessment and tiered instruction, and then special education promises and pitfalls. Those two courses are going to stack up on each other in the fall. Social studies is in there, number operations and algebraic thinking. And then we're also going to take you through classroom management, parts two and three. You get classroom management part one in the summer. And more than likely, that'll be taught by someone who's currently a teacher in one of our partner schools. Sense making is the course that's led by our assistant directors. I'm not sure if Michelle was on, um, but when we hear when we do finally get you to touch base with an assistant director, you'll hear a little bit more about what that scope looks like. Um, and then planning boot camp happens because you're on your way to your student teach. So you don't have courses throughout the majority of January, but you will be in planning boot camp. 
So I want everybody who's in chat to chat me which course they are most excited about taking. All right, Sarah wants social studies. Those were always my favorite classes. Sense making, okay, very good. Yeah, reading in the upper grades is a good course. I think it will be a really good course. All right, Amit or Sean or Zoe, or do we have you? I just wanna make sure we're being more interactive. Okay, I've got three votes, four votes. Oh, hi, Amit. We, on the last slide, nope, a reading in the upper grades. Okay, great, everybody gets that class. Fantastic, go back. A uh, slide, please. That way. That's great. Okay. Awesome. So this slide walks a little bit through our scope of clinical goals. Um, and it really talks about what you're going to be doing in your classroom. So there is no balcony at Urban Teachers. There's no period of time where you as a resident are going to be standing back watching things happen. You, we get you in there early because we want you to have experience with real students doing awesome work from your first day in the program. And it might feel a little overwhelming. Um, so in August and September, the first day you start, you're gonna be planning alongside your teachers, getting your classroom set up, and you're gonna jump in to co-facilitating classroom management. So from day one, the students are gonna know you as one of their co-teachers and likely just see you as the second teacher in the room. You're also gonna have responsibility for one portion of the daily instructional agenda. So I have one, court, one school that where all of their residents teach either a science or social studies period, starting on day one. And then you'll be responsible for three whole group lessons. And you'll start student teaching three days paired with a fellow resident. If you look closely at the right-hand column, student teaching, you'll see that by November, you're gonna have one week solo on your own of teaching, five consecutive days, and the same thing in December. We made this shift because we felt like waiting till January for folks to really understand what it looks like to lead a day of instruction was just waiting a little bit too long. So that is which, that's just a sample of the clinical goals for fall semester. When you get your resident um, handbook, you're gonna get a little bit more information on what this looks like, and it can be subject to change. Sound good? All right. Also, these are our certification options. So I don't know if you've gotten your program of study notification yet, you likely haven't. Um, but for DC, we are very oversubscribed for secondary ELA. So if you are interested in secondary ELA, we'll be sending you a writing prompt. We will be sending you a whole variety of material um, in regards to next steps to make sure you apply for the secondary ELA program. It's a very rigorous, writing-heavy, literature-heavy program of study. Um, and we want to ensure that we have folks who are really skilled in, in writing in that particular program. Secondary math is similar. We're also gonna do a transcript review to see if that's the program for you. But we do have the greatest need in elementary education and our elementary program of study goes all the way up to early, goes all the way down to early childhood and pre-K four. That's the earliest grade you would teach with that certification and as high as sixth grade. So it's really important that in this particular slide that you are teaching in the subject area where you are certified. Otherwise, our state authorizer will say, hey, you're not teaching what you're certified to teach. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us. So we are going to be a little bit particular with your placement to make sure that you are staying within your grade band. In addition, everybody gets their license in special education, non-categorical K through 12. So all of you would be eligible special education teachers as well. And then last year, 96% of our host teachers said that residents impact, positively impacted student learning. So there's no harm in you being a resident. It's really value added for our students um, and our host teachers see that as well. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about living in DC. So the Washington DC area is a wonderful place to live. I moved here in 2001 and I've never really left. Um, and it will suck you in as well. It's a great city, both for all of the amazing things that you'll see on NBC or the nightly news about what's happening in the nation's capital. But I think the real excitement of living in DC is what happens in the neighborhoods that are a little off the beaten path. So right now, 58% of our residents live within the borders of Washington, DC. I don't know how much history you know, but that scraggly side of the map is Virginia. Virginia didn't want to give their part of the district, so they've kept it. And then up to the kind of north and east is Maryland. Um, so it's not Maryland, it's Maryland. I had to learn that when I moved here. Um, and so 18% of our residents live in Virginia, 24% live in Maryland. As you're thinking about where to live, it might be worth noting 
that your school, if it's in Southeast, might be closer to Maryland than most of the places you'd want to live in the district. And your school might be closer to Virginia than a lot of places in the district. So we're all over the place. And then over 50% of our DC residents live in the Petworth or H Street neighborhoods. And H Street is a fairly new neighborhood, very up and coming. So this map, if you go back one, um, really walks through the, the median rent in DC. And it's actually gone up. I think we're the second highest, maybe third highest after New York and San Francisco. So you're gonna wanna get a roommate. You may wanna see where current fellows and residents live and see if you can find a room in their, in their dwelling. Um, but rents in DC have gotten really, really high. It's a little bit cheaper to live in places that are further from the central part of the district. And it's also worth noting that most likely, given that all of our, um, a lot of our placements are in Southeast, you probably will not be able to Metro to work. So you'll want to carpool or find somebody with a car, but a lot of our schools are not on public transportation because fun fact, DC built its public transportation system to get tourists from the suburbs into the monuments. Like I said, a lot of our schools are not located near those fancy monuments or near the Capitol. So you're probably not gonna have a lot of Metro service um, in those areas. So I just want you to know that as you think about where to live. Next slide. Um, this also compares the cost of living expenses in DC, monthly rent in an expensive area. As you think about budgeting, um, these are just some helpful hints on how to really manage your stipend. So it's not cheap. If you see two tickets to the movies, it's $27. Um, some fancy Italian restaurant is $97 for dinner for two. I haven't been to that one. Um, and so these are just a few comparisons for um, what it costs to live in DC. You can look through these at your own leisure. So that's just a little bit about living and working in the District of Columbia. Um, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to teach. I think there's a ton of opportunities for anyone who really wants to get a jump start on their career. Um, I just ran into someone recently who was leading a program, an educational program at the District of Columbia. And I remember when she was a teacher four or five years ago as a first year teacher. And so there's a lot of really rapid growth for folks who wanna get into teacher leadership, but there's also a huge need for teachers who wanna lead from their classroom. Um, so I hope I haven't over talked too much and given you my story of what happens in DC. Um, but I would love to answer any questions that you might have. You can chat me. I don't know. Can we see them, Carrie, or no? Can they only see us? You're on mute. Um, I can't. I can't see the questions. I can see the chat. Yeah, I think so, the chat is the thing that I'm looking yep. at. So you yeah. do have a question there. Um, yeah. Well, we know our school placement in time to base our housing decisions on that. Mm -hmm. So we are aiming to have your school placements out by mid-July. Um, I don't, I wouldn't put a deposit down until you know your placement. At the same time, the district is not that big. So if you live somewhere within Washington, D.C., you would not be more than 10 miles away from your school placement. Um, so sometimes people want to live really close to their school. I'm one of those people who wants to leave, live a little distance away from where I work. Um, but you won't, you would have it in time to make a housing decision, but the housing market here is pretty tight. So I would wait until you have your placement, um, but it's going to be a really rapid turnaround to get a place for August. Good question, Caitlin. Amara, did you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you covered everything. Um, I know that last year, so a lot of our residents would um, kind of have some places in mind um, that they're and with with their friends as well that they that they've made over the summer, so that when they get the placements, they would just go and make the deposit either the next day or the next two days. So I would definitely say have some places in mind, um, and then that way when you get your placement, you can decide from there whether or not that place the places you're thinking of which one would be the best fit for you. Other questions? People get very anxious around their placement. It's important to realize there are more than enough places for every single resident to have a placement on their own. Um, so you will be placed somewhere in a school with kids. You will be in a placement, hopefully, with other urban teachers, fellows in the building. And even if you aren't, you will be supported by our faculty and staff. What other burning questions do you have? 
What about my folks who are excited about reading in the upper grades? Any questions? All right, Carrie, anything to close us out? I don't know if folks just aren't, don't have their question formed or they're overwhelmed yeah, or- if they don't I have any, that's that. okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure yeah. that there's a question in there somewhere. So um, hopefully folks on the call and I recognize most of the names. So, um, so you all have been in touch and been on webinars before. Um, so obviously you know that we're available to, if uh, you think of something later. Uh, here's, here's one more here. Um, so that's a good yeah. question. Is it unusual for residents to live with people outside of the program? Um, no, it's not. I mean, it's up to you how you want to make that work. I think actually I found more people cluster with other folks in the program than I realized. And I usually find that information out by accident. It's like, oh, last night at dinner, we all read the Monday message together. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's whatever people choose. I would, I would talk to some of the summer mentors about openings they might have in their resident, in their houses that are budget friendly. Um, and it's really hard to have a weekend job to do this program. So you're going to get a stipend through us. Um, but I think that you're going to need your weekends to do your coursework and your clinical assignments. I really think that if you take on a weekend job, it's too much to be able to complete this year of the program. It's also important to remember this is just one year. It's actually 14 months. After summer B, after the end of next summer for you, you will be a teacher of record. You will only have coursework one to two nights a week. You'll have more time to take on additional responsibilities or work with an after school club. But for this residency year, you're essentially learning the art of teaching in 14 months. Um, so I would really try, I know it's a lot of sacrifice, it's very tough, but I'd really try to spend as much energy as possible on doubling down on your practice and learning as much as you can during this year. Mm -hmm. Good question, Caitlin, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, and you can keep asking questions if you think of some after this. So. Um, uh, you all have my email, I think, and I'll put it in the tool. Oh, Zoe, yeah. moving to the summer housing. So our first day is June 19th. Um, in the past, I mean, that's been the day to move in. That's our move-in day. I believe that's a Monday, right, Darlene? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. That's when our dorms are available. If you really have to move in the day before, I mean, we've been able to make that allowance, but we really prefer that folks move in on June 19th. You'll have the whole day. We we'll have people to move you in. You'll get all of your information that day. And it's a really a pretty laid back day where you just walk through all the stations, you sign up for the program, you'll have the attention of our whole onboarding and, and move-in team. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit of information on summer housing. Mm -hmm. um, Amit, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So given that a lot of our residents are at their schools um, until, until about three o'clock or four o'clock each day, coursework starts between five and 5.30 and it ends by eight o'clock at night, Monday through Thursday. So it's a long day. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, I know Mara's planning an orientation webinar too in May. I don't know if you know, for the incoming cohort. So you get into a lot of these questions too. And yeah. Amara, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, what you picked. <laughs> um, yeah, it will be sent in a Monday message. So all of these will be communicated with you within a timely fashion for you to be able to participate in these webinars but mm -hmm. we will definitely um, have all the little minute details for you because we want to make sure this is as smooth a process for you as well mm -hmm. all right everyone that looks like you've asked most of your questions and you've got amara and carrie's information mm -hmm. um, if you're in dc and you want to come and meet our team i'd be happy to meet all of you, but if not, I mean, totally good. We'll see most of you on June 19th, or all of you on June 19th, which is our first move-in day, and then June 20th is orientation, all at Catholic University, so it's going to be really exciting, and like I said, store up all of the extra energy that you have now and bring it with you to Summer Institute. I think you're going to really, really enjoy it, so it's one of my favorite times of year, um, and I'm really excited to just meet everybody. Super. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.